Welcome once again to Horror Bubble. Today, I will be reading a bit of Robert E. Howard. This is Dig Me No Grave. I hope you enjoy it. Be sure to consult the video description below for further information on what it is we do here at Horror Bubble. Dig Me No Grave by Robert E. Howard The thunder of my old-fashioned door-knocker, reverberating eerily through the house, roused me from a restless and nightmare-haunted sleep. I looked out the window. In the last light of the sinking moon, the white face of my friend, John Conrad, looked up at me. "'May I come up, Kirouan? His voice was shaky and strained. "'Certainly.' I sprang out of bed and pulled on a bathrobe, as I heard him enter the front door and ascend the stairs. A moment later, he stood before me, and in the light which I had turned on, I saw his hands tremble, and noticed the unnatural pallor of his face. "'Old John Grimlin died an hour ago,' he said abruptly. "'Indeed? I had not known that he was ill. It was a sudden, virulent attack of peculiar nature, a sort of seizure somewhat akin to epilepsy. He has been subject to such spells of late years, you know." I nodded. I knew something of the old hermit-like man who had lived in his great dark house on the hill. Indeed, I had once witnessed one of his strange seizures, and I had been appalled at the writhings, howlings, and yammerings of the wretch, who had grovelled on the earth like a wounded snake, gibbering terrible curses and black blasphemies until his voice broke in a wordless screaming, which spattered his lips with foam. Seeing this, I understood why people in old times looked on such victims as men possessed by demons. "'Some hereditary taint,' Conrad was saying. "'Old John doubtless fell heir to some ingrown weakness brought on by some loathsome disease, which was his heritage from perhaps a remote ancestor. Such things occasionally happen, or else well, you know, old John himself pried about in the mysterious parts of the earth, and wandered all over the east in his younger days. It is quite possible that he was infected with some obscure malady in his wanderings. There are still many unclassified diseases in Africa and the Orient. But, said I, you have not told me the reason for this sudden visit at this unearthly hour, for I notice that it is past midnight. My friend seemed rather confused. Well, the fact is that John Grimlin died alone. Except for myself, he refused to receive any medical aid of any sort, and in the last few moments, when it was evident that he was dying, and I was prepared to go for some sort of help in spite of him, he set up such a howling and screaming that I could not refuse his passionate pleas, which were that he should not be left to die alone. I have seen men die, added Conrad, wiping the perspiration from his pale brow but the death of John Grimlin was the most fearful I have ever seen. He suffered a great deal. He appeared to be in much physical agony, but this was mostly submerged by some monstrous mental or psychic suffering. The fear in his distended eyes and his screams transcended any conceivable earthly terror. I tell you, Kirouan, Grimlin's fright was greater and deeper than the ordinary fear of the beyond shown by a man of ordinarily evil life. I shifted restlessly. The dark implications of this statement sent a chill of nameless apprehension trickling down my spine. I know the country people always claim that in his youth he sold his soul to the devil, and that his sudden epileptic attacks were merely a visible sign of the fiend's power over him, but such talk is foolish, of course, and belongs in the Dark Ages. We all know that John Grimland's life was a peculiarly evil and vicious one, even toward his last days. With good reason, he was universally detested and feared, for I never heard of his doing a single good act. You were his only friend." "'And that was a strange friendship,' said Conrad. I was attracted to him by his unusual powers, for despite his bestial nature, John Grimlin was a highly educated man, a deeply cultured man. He had dipped deep into occult studies, and I first met him in this manner, for as you know, I have always been strongly interested in these lines of research myself. But, in this, as in all other things, Grimlin was evil and perverse. 
He had ignored the white side of the occult and delved into the darker, grimmer phases of it, into devil worship and voodoo and Shintoism. His knowledge of these foul arts and sciences was immense and unholy, and to hear him tell of his researches and experiments was to know such horror and repulsion as a venomous reptile might inspire, for there had been no depths to which he had not sunk, and some things he only hinted at, even to me. I tell you, Kirouan, it is easy to laugh at tales of the black world of the unknown, when one is in pleasant company under the bright sunlight, but had you sat at ungodly hours in the silent, bizarre library of John Grimlin, and looked on the ancient, musty volumes, and listened to his grisly talk as I did, your tongue would have cloven to your palate with sheer horror, as mine did, and the supernatural would have seemed very real and near to you, as it seemed to me. But in God's name, man, I cried, for the tension was growing unbearable. Come to the point, and tell me what you want of me. I want you to come with me to John Grimlin's house, and help me carry out his outlandish instructions in regard to his body. I had no liking for the adventure, but I dressed hurriedly, an occasional shudder of premonition shaking me. Once fully clad, I followed Conrad out of the house and up the silent road, which led to the house of John Grimlin. The road wound uphill, and all the way, looking upward and forward, I could see that great grim house perched like a bird of evil on the crest of the hill, bulking black and stark against the stars. In the west, pulsed a single dull red smear, where the young moon had just sunk from view behind the low black hills. The whole night seemed full of brooding evil, and the persistent swishing of a bat's wing somewhere overhead caused my taut nerves to jerk and thrum. To drown the quick pounding of my own heart, I said, Do you share the belief so many hold that John Grimlin was mad? We strode on several paces before Conrad answered, seemingly with a strange reluctance. But for one incident, I would say no man was ever saner. But one night in his study, he seemed suddenly to break all bonds of reason. He had discoursed for hours on his favourite subject, black magic, when suddenly he cried, as his face lit with a weird unholy glow, Why should I sit here babbling such child's prattle to you? These voodoo rituals, these Shinto sacrifices, feathered snakes, goats without horns, black leopard cults, bah! Filth and dust that the wind blows away, dregs of the real unknown, the deep mysteries, mere echoes from the abyss. I could tell you things that would shatter your paltry brain. I could breathe into your ear names that would wither you like a burnt weed. What do you know of Yogg-Sothoth, or Cthulhu's, and the sunken cities? None of these names is even included in your mythologies. Not even in your dreams have you glimpsed the black Cyclopean walls of Koth, or shriveled before the noxious winds that blow from your goth. But I will not blast you lifeless with my black wisdom. I cannot expect your infantile brain to bear what mine holds. Were you as old as I, had you seen as I have seen, kingdoms crumble and generations pass away, had you gathered as ripe grain the dark secrets of the centuries? He was raving away his wildly lit face scarcely human in appearance, and suddenly, noting my evident bewilderment, he burst into a horrible, cackling laugh. "'Gad!' he cried in a voice and accent strange to me. "'Methinks I've frighted ye, and certes, it is not to be marvelled at, sith ye be but a naked salvage in the arts of life after all. Ye think I be old, eh? Why, ye gaping lout, ye drop dead right to divulge the generations of men I've known!' But at this point such horror overcame me that I fled from him, as from an adder, and his high-pitched diabolical laughter followed me out of the shadowy house. Some days later I received a letter, apologising for his manner, and ascribing it candidly, too candidly, to drugs. I did not believe it, but I renewed our relations, after some hesitation. "'It sounds like utter madness,' I muttered. "'Yes,' admitted Conrad, hesitantly. But. Kirouan, have you ever seen anyone who knew John Grimlin in his youth? I shook my head. I have been at pains to inquire about him discreetly, said Conrad. He has lived here, with the exception of mysterious absences, often for months at a time. For twenty years, the older villagers remember distinctly when he first came and took over that old house on the hill, and they all say that in the intervening years he seems not to have aged perceptibly. When he came here, 
he looked just as he does now, or did, up to the moment of his death, of the appearance of a man about fifty. I met old von Bonk in Vienna, who said he knew Grimlin when a very young man studying in Berlin, fifty years ago, and he expressed astonishment that the old man was still living, for he said at that time Grimlin seemed to be about fifty years of age. I gave an incredulous exclamation, seeing the implication toward which the conversation was trending. Nonsense! Professor von Bonk is past eighty himself, and liable to the errors of extreme age. He confused this man with another. Yet, as I spoke, my flesh crawled unpleasantly, and the hairs on my neck prickled. Well, shrugged Conrad, here we are at the house. The huge pile reared up menacingly before us, and as we reached the front door, a vagrant wind moaned through the nearby trees, and I started foolishly, as I again heard the ghostly beat of the bat's wings. Conrad turned a large key in the antique lock, and as we entered, a cold draught swept across us like a breath from the grave, mouldy and cold. I shuddered. We groped our way through a black hallway, and into a study, and here Conrad lighted a candle, for no gas lights or electric lights were to be found in the house. I looked about me, dreading what the light might disclose, but the room, heavy tapestried and bizarrely furnished, was empty, save for us two. Where, where, where is it? I asked in a husky whisper, from a throat gone dry. Upstairs, answered Conrad in a low voice, showing that the silence and mystery of the house had laid a spell on him also. Upstairs, in the library where he died. I glanced up involuntarily. Somewhere above our head, the lone master of this grim house was stretched out in his last sleep, silent, his white face set in a grinning mask of death. Panic swept over me, and I fought for control. After all, it was merely the corpse of a wicked old man, who was past harming anyone. This argument rang hollowly in my brain like the words of a frightened child, who was trying to reassure himself. I turned to Conrad. He had taken a time-yellowed envelope from an inside pocket. This, he said, removing from the envelope several pages of closely written time-yellowed parchment, is, in effect, the last word of John Grimlin, though God alone knows how many years ago it was written. He gave it to me ten years ago, immediately after his return from Mongolia. It was shortly after this that he had his first seizure. This envelope he gave me, sealed, and he made me swear that I would hide it carefully, and that I would not open it until he was dead, when I was to read the contents and follow their directions exactly. More, he made me swear that no matter what he said or did after giving me the envelope, I would go ahead as first directed. For, he said with a fearful smile, the flesh is weak, but I am a man of my word, and though I might, in a moment of weakness, wish to retract, it is far, far too late now. You may never understand the matter, but you are to do as I have said." Well? Well, again Conrad wiped his brow. Tonight, as he lay writhing in his death agonies, his wordless howls were mingled with frantic admonitions to me to bring him the envelope and destroy it before his eyes. As he yammered this, he forced himself up on his elbows, and with eyes staring and hair standing straight up on his head, he screamed at me in a manner to chill the blood and he was shrieking for me to destroy the envelope, not to open it, and once he howled in his delirium for me to hew his body into pieces, and scatter the bits to the four winds of heaven. An uncontrollable exclamation of horror escaped my dry lips. At last, went on Conrad, I gave in. Remembering his commands ten years ago, I at first stood firm, but at last, as his screeches grew unbearably desperate, I turned to go for the envelope even though that meant leaving him alone. But as I turned, with one last fearful convulsion in which blood-flecked foam flew from his writhing lips, the life went from his twisted body in a single great wrench. He fumbled at the parchment. I am going to carry out my promise. The directions herein seem fantastic, and may be the whims of a disordered mind. But I gave my word. They are, briefly, that I place his corpse on the great black ebony table in his library, with seven black candles burning about him. The doors and windows are to be firmly closed and fastened. Then, in the darkness which precedes dawn, I am to read the formula, 
charm or spell which is contained in a smaller, sealed envelope inside the first, and which I have not yet opened. But is that all? I cried. No provisions as to the disposition of his fortune, his estate, or his corpse? Nothing. In his will, which I have seen elsewhere, he leaves estate and fortune to a certain oriental gentleman named in the document as Malik Tus. What? I cried, shaken to my soul. Conrad, this is madness, heaped on madness. Malik Tus, good God! No mortal man was ever so named. That is the title of the foul good, worshipped by the mysterious Yezidis. They of Mount Alamut, the accursed, whose eight brazen towers rise in the mysterious wastes of deep Asia. His idolatrous symbol is the brazen peacock, and the Mohammedans, who hate his demon-worshipping devotees, say he is the essence of the evil of all the universes, the prince of darkness, Araman, the old serpent, the veritable Satan. And you say Grimlin names this mythical demon in his will? It is the truth. Conrad's throat was dry. And look, he has scribbled a strange line at the corner of this parchment. Dig me no grave. I shall not need one. Again, a chill wandered down my spine. In God's name, I cried, in a kind of frenzy. Let us get this incredible business over with. I think a drink might help, answered Conrad, moistening his lips. It seems to me I've seen Grimlin go into this cabinet for wine. He bent to the door of an ornately carved mahogany cabinet, and after some difficulty, opened it. "'No wine here,' he said disappointedly, "'and if ever I felt the need of stimulants. What's this?' He drew out a roll of parchment, dusty, yellowed, and half-covered with spider-webs. Everything in that grim house seemed, to my nervously excited senses, fraught with mysterious meaning and import, and I leaned over his shoulder as he unrolled it. It's a record of peerage, he said, such a chronicle of births, deaths, and so forth, as the old families used to keep in the sixteenth century and earlier. What's the name? I asked. He scowled over the dim scrawls, striving to master the faded, archaic script. G R Y M. I've got it. Grimlin, of course. It's the records of old John's family. The Grimlins of Toad's Heath Manor, Suffolk. What an outlandish name for an estate! Look at the last entry. Together we read, John Grimlin, born March 10th, 1630, and then we both cried out. Under this entry was freshly written in a strange scrawling hand, died March 10th, 1930. Below this there was a seal of black wax, stamped with a strange design, something like a peacock with a spreading tail. Conrad stared at me speechless. All the colour ebbed from his face. I shook myself with the rage, engendered by fear. "'It's the hoax of a madman!' I shouted. "'The stage has been set with such great care that the actors have overstepped themselves. Whoever they are, they have heaped up so many incredible effects as to nullify them. It's all a very stupid, very dull drama of illusion.' And even as I spoke, icy sweat stood out on my body, and I shook as with an ague. With a wordless motion, Conrad turned toward the stairs, taking up a large candle from a mahogany table. "'It was understood, I suppose,' he whispered, "'that I should go through with this ghastly matter alone, but I had not the moral courage, and now I am glad I had not.' A still horror brooded over the silent house as we went up the stairs. A faint breeze stole in from somewhere, and set the heavy velvet hangings rustling, and I visualized stealthy, Talent fingers, drawing aside the tapestries, to fix red gloating eyes upon us. Once I thought I heard the indistinct clumping of monstrous feet somewhere above us, but it must have been the heavy pounding of my own heart. The stairs debouched into a wide dark corridor, in which our feeble candle cast a faint gleam, which but illuminated our pale faces, and made the shadow seem darker by comparison. We stopped at a heavy door and I heard Conrad's breath draw in sharply as a man's will, when he braces himself physically or mentally. I involuntarily clenched my fists, until the nails bit into the palms. Then Conrad thrust the door open. A sharp cry escaped his lips. The candle dropped from his nerveless fingers, and went out.
The library of John Grimland was ablaze with light, though the whole house had been in darkness when we entered it. This light came from seven black candles, placed at regular intervals about the great ebony table. On this table, between the candles, I had braced myself against the sight. Now, in the face of the mysterious illumination and the sight of the thing on the table, my resolution nearly gave way. John Grimlin had been unlovely in life. In death, he was hideous. Yes, he was hideous, even though his face was mercifully covered with the same curious silken robe which worked in fantastic bird-like designs, covered his whole body, except the crooked claw-like hands and the bare withered feet. A strangling sound came from Conrad. "'My God!' he whispered. "'What is this?' I laid his body out on the table and placed the candles about it, but I did not light them, nor did I place that robe over the body, and there were bedroom slippers on his feet when I left. He halted suddenly. We were not alone in the death room. At first, we had not seen him, as he sat in the great armchair in a farther nook of a corner, so still that he seemed a part of the shadows cast by the heavy tapestries. As my eyes fell upon him, a violent shuddering shook me and a feeling akin to nausea racked the pit of my stomach. My first impression was of vivid, oblique, yellow eyes which gazed unwinkingly at us. Then the man rose and made a deep salaam, and we saw that he was an Oriental. Now, when I strive to etch him clearly in my mind, I can resurrect no plain image of him. I only remember those piercing eyes and the yellow, fantastic robe he wore. We returned his salute mechanically, and he spoke in a low, refined voice. "'Gentlemen, I crave your pardon. I have made so free as to light the candles. Shall we not proceed with the business pertaining to our mutual friend?' He made a slight gesture toward the silent bulk on the table. Conrad nodded, evidently unable to speak. The thought flashed through our minds at the same time, that this man had also been given a sealed envelope. But how had he come to the Grimlin house so quickly? John Grimlin had been dead scarcely two hours, and to the best of our knowledge no one knew of his demise but ourselves, and how had he got into the locked and bolted house? The whole affair was grotesque and unreal in the extreme. We did not even introduce ourselves or ask the stranger his name. He took charge in a matter-of-fact way and so under the spell of horror and illusion were we, that we moved dazedly, involuntarily obeying his suggestions, given us in a low, respectful tone. I found myself standing on the left side of the table, looking across its grisly burden at Conrad. The Oriental stood with arms folded and head bowed at the head of the table, nor did it then strike me as being strange that he should stand there, instead of Conrad, who was to read what Grimlin had written. I found my gaze drawn to the figure worked on the breast of the stranger's robe in black silk, a curious figure, somewhat resembling a peacock, and somewhat resembling a bat or a flying dragon. I noted with a start that the same design was worked on the robe, covering the corpse. The doors had been locked, the windows fastened down. Conrad, with a shaky hand, opened the inner envelope, and fluttered open the parchment sheets contained therein. These sheets seemed much older than those containing the instructions to Conrad in the larger envelope. Conrad began to read in a monotonous drone, which had the effect of hypnosis on the hearer. So at times the candles grew dim in my gaze, and the room and its occupants swam strange and monstrous, veiled and distorted like an hallucination. Most of what he read was gibberish. It meant nothing. Yet the sound of it, and the archaic style of it, filled me with an intolerable horror. To ye contract elsewhere recorded, I, John Grimlin, hereby swear by ye name of ye nameless one, to keep good faith. Wherefore do I now write in blood these words spoken to me in this grim and silent chamber, in ye dead city of Corth, where to no mortal man hath attained but me? These same words now writ down by me to be read over my body at ye appointed time to fulfil my part of ye bargain, which I entered into of my own free will and knowledge, being of right mind and fifty years of age, this year of 1680 A.D. Here beginneth ye incantation. Before man was, 
ye elder ones were, and even yet their Lord dwelleth among ye shadows, to which if a man set his foot he may not turn upon his track." The words merged into a barbaric gibberish, as Conrad stumbled through an unfamiliar language, a language faintly suggesting the Phoenician, but shuddery, with the touch of a hideous antiquity beyond any remembered earthly tongue. One of the candles flickered and went out. I made a move to relight it, but a motion from the silent Oriental stayed me. His eyes burned into mine, then shifted back to the still form on the table. The manuscript had shifted back into its archaic English. And ye mortal which gaineth to ye black citadels of Koth, and speaks with ye dark lord, whose face is hidden, for a price may he gain his heart's desire, riches and knowledge beyond counting, and life beyond mortal span even two hundred and fifty years. Again, Conrad's voice trailed off into unfamiliar gutturals. Another candle went out. Let not ye mortal flinch, as ye time draweth nigh for payment, and ye fires of hell lay hold upon ye vitals, as the sign of reckoning. For ye prince of darkness taketh his due in ye end, and he is not to be cozened. What ye have promised, that shall ye deliver, O Ganthony Shuba. At the first sound of those barbaric accents, a cold hand of terror locked about my throat. My frantic eyes shot to the candles, and I was not surprised to see another flicker out. Yet there was no hint of any draught to stir the heavy black hangings. Conrad's voice wavered. He drew his hand across his throat, gagging momentarily. The eyes of the Oriental never altered. Among ye sons of men glide strange shadows forever. Men see ye tracks of ye talons, but not ye feet that make them. Over ye souls of men spread great black wings. There is but one black master, though men call him Satanus, and Beelzebub, and Apollyon, and Araman, and Malik Tus. Mists of horror engulfed me. I was dimly aware of Conrad's voice droning on and on, both in English and in that other fearsome tongue, whose horrific import I scarcely dared try to guess, and with stark fear clutching at my heart, I saw the candles go out, one by one, and with each flicker, as the gathering gloom darkened about us, my horror mounted. I could not speak. I could not move. My distended eyes were fixed with agonized intensity on the remaining candle. The silent Oriental at the head of that ghastly table was included in my fear. He had not moved nor spoken, but under his drooping lids, his eyes burned with devilish triumph. I knew that beneath his inscrutable exterior, he was gloating fiendishly. But why? Why? But I knew that the moment the extinguishing of the last candle plunged the room into utter darkness, some nameless, abominable thing would take place. Conrad was approaching the end. His voice rose to the climax in gathering crescendo. Approacheth now, ye moment of payment. Ye ravens are flying. Ye bats wing against ye sky. There are skulls in ye stars. Ye soul and ye body are promised, and shall be delivered up, not to ye dust again, nor ye elements from which spring life. The candle flickered slightly. I tried to scream, but my mouth gaped to a soundless yammering. I tried to flee, but I stood frozen, unable even to close my eyes. Ye abyss yawns, and ye debt is to pay. Ye light fails, ye shadows gather. There is no god but evil, no light but darkness, no hope but doom. A hollow groan resounded through the room. It seemed to come from the robe-covered thing on the table. That robe twitched fitfully. O oh, wings in ye black dark! I started violently. A faint swish sounded in the gathering shadows. The stir of the dark hangings? It sounded like the rustle of gigantic wings. O oh, red eyes in ye shadows! What is promised, what is written blood, is fulfilled. Your light is gulfed in blackness. Ya koth! The last candle went out suddenly, and a ghastly, unhuman cry that came not from my lips or from Conrad's burst unbearably forth. Horror swept over me like a black, icy wave. In the blind dark I heard myself screaming terribly. Then, with a swirl and a great rush of wind, something swept the room flinging the hangings aloft and dashing chairs and tables, crashing to the floor. For an instant, an intolerable odour burned our nostrils. 
A low, hideous, tittering mocked us in the blackness. Then silence fell like a shroud. Somehow, Conrad found a candle and lighted it. The faint glow showed us the room in fearful disarray, showed us each other's ghastly faces, and showed us the black, ebony table, empty. The doors and windows were locked as they had been, but the Oriental was gone, and so was the corpse of John Grimlin. Shrieking like damned men, we broke down the door and fled frenziedly down the well-like staircase, where the darkness seemed to clutch at us with clammy black fingers. As we tumbled down into the lower hallway, a lurid glow cut the darkness, and the scent of burning wood filled our nostrils. The outer doorway held momentarily against our frantic assault, then gave way, and we hurtled into the outer starlight. Behind us, the flames leaped up with a crackling roar as we fled down the hill. Conrad, glancing over his shoulder, halted suddenly, wheeled and flung up his arms like a madman, and screamed, "'Soul and body he sold to Malik Tus, who is Satan, two hundred and fifty years ago. This was the night of payment, and my God, look, look, the fiend has claimed his own!' I looked, frozen with horror. Flames had enveloped the whole house with appalling swiftness, and now the great mass was etched against the shadowed sky, a crimson inferno, and above the holocaust hovered a gigantic black shadow, like a monstrous bat, and from its dark clutch dangled a small white thing, like the body of a man, dangling limply. Then, even as we cried out in horror, it was gone, and our dazed gaze met only the shuddering walls and blazing roof, which crumpled into the flames with an earth-shaking roar. Thank you for listening today. If you enjoyed this reading and would like to support our work here at Horror Bubble, please feel free to pay us a visit over at Patreon. Links to Patreon and the Bandcamp shop can be found in the video description below. Until next time, goodbye.